So I'm delighted to be joined by um, former England rugby player and, of, of course, a man of Bath and now the communications director here at Bath Rugby, David Flatman. And David's going to be joining me for the next couple of, uh, well, the next few weeks um, during the course of the British and, Iron, uh, and Irish Lions tour of, um, of Australia. And uh, we kick off our first interview um, looking, uh, starting off by um, uh, looking at the squad selection, but perhaps asking the big question... Um, David, do you think that the British and Irish Lions is still relevant as a concept in the modern professional era? No, not really. No, I do. I, do. <laughs> um, I think they're hugely relevant. I think um, you only have to look at the buzz created around the Lions and look at the excitement, certainly in the world of rugby, about it. I mean, I have. I live in a little village outside Bath, and people love their rugby, but I had a, a local housewife stop me yesterday and ask me if I was the chubby guy with an apple on his mouth on the, in his mouth on the British Lions TV advert you know she's even excited about it and I think it's hugely relevant I mean sport has always been about pinnacles and achievement and winning and trophies and um, the elite and this is really certainly in you know these these islands is the elite of the elite so it's um, I think as long as sport's relevant the British Lions will be relevant so it's a sort of a classic of journalistic paper talk, though, isn't it, to say that um, is, this, is this old invitational side still relevant when actually the fans, as you said, and the, and the players from what you can gather, they still love it. The other part of paper talk is that uh, it's about time that the Lions won because they haven't won, and if they're not winning and it's not a contest, then it's not relevant. So do you think that the Lions have to win this tour? Well, it's difficult to win in the Southern Hemisphere. Don't forget, we, I say we, the Lions play one of the top three teams in the world every four years so they don't muck about you know they don't sort of drop in on a couple of you know for a couple of on a couple of friendly islands on the way they're not playing with the greatest respect Fiji and Samoa um, doing anyone a favour they're going to the hardest places in the world to win and you know in England one in 2003 it was monumental because we'd overcome the southern hemisphere giants and and actually you look at Wales Wales of how dominant of Wales been the last few years and sort of Six Nations rugby along with France admittedly but Wales have been hugely hugely powerful and they lost the last eight matches against Australia you know they're very very difficult to beat because they're very very good at the game so um, I think it has been a while since the Lions won and yes I think if you want to make it if you want to really make history it's about being part of a victorious Lions squad but then Actually, you're talking about these blokes, certainly in the professional era, certainly. Just by being on that plane, their lives are changed. They will always be a British Lion. And while that won't be enough for them, they will always, if they lose, reference the fact that they lost. They will always be a British Lion. That will always be on their resume. And um, it's, uh, it's kind of like reaching the Olympic final and not winning. You'll always be an Olympic finalist, but you'll never have won it So unless you won it. So uh, I think... It is relevant, it is important, um, and it might be an old invitational side, but for me it, it's very, very different from a barbarian setup, which is, I love the barbarians, you know, a big fan, love watching them, but really you're, you're talking about a load of the top players in the world, fingers crossed, not much training, and a few beers seven or eight nights a week on tour, you know, it's great, and everyone wants that call because it's such a great trip, but... The Lions is different from that. I'm sure they'll bond together in, you know, Australian bars here and there and the odd student union, they have a nice time, but they are this is a very, very professional, no expense spared setup. So these guys are here to win. This is a full professional sporting setup and the barbarians maybe all expenses paid, but it's it's not quite as intense, I don't think. So we want, obviously, we're hoping for the Lions to win, but do you think that the squad that Warren Gatland has selected, is it a squad that can win in Australia? Yeah, I think it is. Um, although I don't think they're going to find it easy. I think this is a, a squad built primarily around brute force. And, um, of course, there are some players who are a lot more than that in that squad. You know, look at Brian O'Driscoll. There's more to him than brute force. There's more to Johnny Sexton than brute force. Um but I think you look at the guys they've picked, um, and they are. Of course, there will be a lot more. It'll be a lot. It'll be a lot more sort of nuance than get around the corner and smash the ball up. But I think there will be a lot of very, very direct rugby on this tour, and that isn't the rugby equivalent of long ball football. It's. Uh, 
I think direct rugby can be fantastic to watch because actually we all love we all love seeing physical confrontations and enormous collisions and physical domination on the TV and live. We love seeing that. So I think that'll be great. But I think any anything special will be built on a foundation of power for this trip. And I think when in the Australians you're talking about they're not a team that people would class as one of the most powerful in the world, but their backline is powerful. Adam Ashley Cooper's a hugely powerful. Dig Bioani, hugely powerful guy. Their front row, their first choice front row, much maligned, very, very good front row, world class front row. Um, they've got big guys knocking around and they're, they're painfully intelligent as a nation, sportingly. They're very, very intelligent and in rugby terms. They're very, very good at cancelling out the strengths of other teams. Um, don't forget, this is the side that stopped what everyone thought was the best all black side in history. You know, winning a world record number of games on the bounce. You know, they're a very, very clever team, and I don't think there'll be too much in terms of the Lions' game plan left to the imagination. I think the Australians will be very well prepared, so it'll be difficult to beat. When with any squad selection, people always start off by looking at the players who haven't made the final cut, and perhaps mm. one as as England fans, we're all we're all looking to see pre- um, the name of Johnny Wilkinson. Now, Johnny didn't get the call. Did that surprise you? didn't surprise me, no. Um, I didn't think he would, but I thought he should. Um, and there is a difference, I think. Um, Johnny's old in rugby terms. He's battered uh, on any terms. But I think it's too easy to say where well, he's harking back to yesteryear because he doesn't play for England anymore and he plays in a different country and he's kind of away. No one knows quite what he's up to. That it would be a backward step. I don't agree with that. Um, you know, he's no more battered than Brian O'Driscoll, but Brian O'Driscoll's sort of made himself more relevant by continuing to play for Ireland and uh, playing in Leinster, and he hasn't moved away um, and hasn't sort of... Johnny's still on the radar, but he's certainly getting less attention than he used to, um, which I'm sure he enjoys. But I just think having that bloke in the room for, you know, a few weeks, I think, having him on the plane and around the squad is just so so valuable I mean having known Johnny for a long time and been on plenty of tours with him since we were kids he doesn't say an awful lot Um, he really doesn't and a lot of senior players are there to speak so if you're in a squad with Delalio you know he talks an awful lot an awful lot of words come out and they're all of value and he doesn't waste any of them but then someone like Johnny speaks and the room goes quiet not because he's this sort of mythical beast, but because actually he's very intelligent, chooses his words very carefully and doesn't say anything he doesn't mean and actually very, very rarely says anything that isn't of real, real value, speaking from a position of massive experience and achievement. So imagine what it would have been like for Sexton and Farrell to have him on board. You know, just you can't you can't put a number on you know, what he could add to a squad, even if it's just the odd five-minute chat with Warren Gatland and a five- or six-minute chat with Owen Farrell or a quick chat with Jamie Roberts about how he might adjust the line or make things easier for Sexton, who's probably going to start at 10, you know. But whatever that number is, it's worth his tour fee, I'd have thought. So, personally, I'd have had him there. Do, you, do we think that there's perhaps the sort of the curse of Toulon going on here? Because you, you mentioned before about how this side is built for power and yeah. um, there's, there's few more powerful than Andrew Sheridan who's um, and been winning things at Toulon. We've also got the Armitage brothers there, and they're no slouch physically. Um, all of those players have been overlooked for this squad. Does that surprise you? No, it doesn't. Um, firstly, I mean, sort of one by one, as it were, the curse of Toulon, I think it doesn't help that they're doing very well in the top 14. and um, They're still busy while the Lions are starting business. Um, so if someone's going to be called up from there, they've got to be head and shoulders above everyone else because they're missing really valuable prep time on what feels like a long tour but isn't you know in real terms it's not you've got a couple of weeks or a week to bond and then play you know you're expected to win so it's um, it's not a long trip um, Stefan Armitage I always thought an outstanding player um, is he you know is he going to be picked ahead of Sam Warburton Justin to and all these guys I, I don't think he is so I think even if he'd been playing in England in the same vein of form, he wouldn't have been picked. That's my opinion. Um, as good as he is. Darren Armitage, no. Uh, you know, I think whoever he was playing for, 
he's not he's not one of the top fullbacks at the moment. He played well in the Heineken Cup final. He's a very good player. He's done really well for too long. He's very very good under the high ball. But who are you going to drop to pick him in the squad? And bearing in mind he's not going, you know. Mm. So for me that that's that's a, that's a non-issue. But Andrew Sheridan's an interesting one. Again, who's he up against? And who's he going to be up against on tour? Well, you've got Key and Healy, who has gone from being one of those props who can do everything except scrummage to one of those props who can do everything. And he's now a very, very good scrummager. Gave Dan Cole a very hard time in the Six Nations, which doesn't happen too often, actually. Um, and he's really, really accomplished now as a sort of a front row operator, but his work around the field is sensational. I mean, he's the first guy for a long time to challenge Gethin Jenkins, the, the other loose head on tour, one of the other loose heads on tour for all round contribution in a match and I think Sheridan's work rate for a huge bloke is actually very, very good and his error rate is very low but he doesn't offer what Key and Healy offers around the field. Then you look at someone like Mako Vunapola who's an interesting selection so you're picking Vunapola ahead of Sheridan well why are they doing that? You know, If they're going for a power game well actually Mako is unlikely to play as first choice for the Lions. If he does, good on him. But they're probably going to pick Kean Healy. They may pick Gethin Jenkins. Whichever one of those two they don't pick is the guy likely to be on the bench. More, ex- Way more experienced players, arguably more powerful players in the set piece. Now, that leaves Mako, if he's really lucky or really for- does really well, as being on the bench for the test team. So when he comes off the bench, he will either be against the Australian first choice tight head, which will probably be Ben Alexander, Ben Alexander. He'll be tired, or he'll be against the second choice, who he can probably handle. But what he's more likely to be doing is playing midweek for the Lions. So who's, who have they got? The Australians don't have three or four or five top tight heads. They have one and a half top tight heads or two. So actually he's going to be playing against guys that physically he can handle. He's on firm ground, warm weather. He's a, it's a bold selection, but they're looking at someone who can, who's going to be able to handle the set-piece work required and fire around the pitch. And at the moment, there isn't anyone as good as him. I mean, there isn't, there isn't a ball-carrying prop as good as him anywhere. So, you know, I really look forward to him holding a midweek scrum up nice and solid and actually getting his hands on the ball. I think he could cause some real damage. So the Sheridan issue... He would be helped if he didn't play for too long, but I personally, I don't think he's so much more powerful in the set piece than Kean Healy that he deserves his spot. So, get, looking at um, Mako Vinopolo and Matt Stevens, both of whom made the squad, um, actually, does their inclusion mean that David Wilson, your um, colleague here at Bath, was um, unlucky? Do you think to miss out? Yeah, I think no, no one really spoke about Davy uh, before the Lions tour. And that was a bit odd for me because he hit real form for Bath. Um, and he was really, really dominant at that point. And you might argue that, well, I would argue that certainly at premiership level, which was the level everyone was playing, you know, before they got selected, he was the tight head prop in the premiership, certainly, but he was definitely in better form than Dan Cole. That doesn't mean Dan Cole shouldn't go. He absolutely should go. But... I think what will have got Matt Stevens in there will be his ability to cover the loose head and the fact that he's done it more. Now, lots of props say they can cover both sides. He is not comfortable on the loose head, but he has played a whole season on the loose head, give or take, for Saracen, so he is at least experienced there. Davy has played a bit of loose head. He's capped. He played against, came off the bench against France at loose head a couple of years ago in Paris. Otherwise, he's played very little. And... Having that string to your bow makes a real difference. And I'm pretty sure that's what nudged Matt Stevens ahead of, of Davey. Um, and probably ahead of Paul James, actually, in the end. Now, one man who was selected to play, but it doesn't look like he, he will be going, um, is, um, is Dylan Hartley. And of course, Dylan had a um, difficult weekend. Um, mm. Where do you think he goes from here with his career? Dylan Hartley's got an incredible career. He's had an incredible career and he'll continue to have one. So he is a top, top player. and um, He lost a bit of form in the middle of this season, but he was still good. And when he's... But bear in mind, this attitude that has seen him banned a few times and seen him miss out on this Lions tour is the reason he was picked to play for the Lions. I'm not defending. If 
he did swear at the referee if it was directed at him and I must say I'm I'm not convinced it was um, if it was and Wayne Barnes is adamant he spoke to him well he was there he saw him he heard him he has to be banned and it has to be significant because we cannot allow that in rugby um, but that attitude that sees him punished relatively often when compared with other players is the reason he was picked for the Lions is the reason he's got so many England caps but absolutely that is the reason he's not picked because he's got the best hands in the world he has got good hands he's not the quickest hooker in the world you know he's, he's a very very good rugby player he's comfortably good enough to play for England and the Lions which makes him extremely good He's picked because of his attitude and his aggression. Now, people look back on the career of Danny Grucock and there will always be some that say he was a thug and he shouldn't have been allowed to play. Well, he got 69 caps. I think he's a double lion, three World Cups, 260-odd games for Bath. An incredible career, absolutely incredible career. And he whacked more people than Mike Tyson. So people look back romantically with him and say, God, wasn't he tough? Well, actually, why was he picked? Was he picked because he had a great offload out the back or because he made breaks and, you know, because he had a lovely... He took the ball to the line and delivered a lovely flat pass? No, he was picked because he played physically on the edge. And England, without Dylan Hartley, lacked that a bit, frankly. Um, Tom Youngs deserves his place. I think he's playing fantastically well in the England team, I mean. But I think they still lack that bit of nasty. And... Even as the game grows professional, it pays to have it. That's why Bucky's both gets paid the big bucks. There's a reason for it. It pays to physically dominate the opposition and to physically get in their faces and either intimidate them or distract them, give them something to think about. And it's easy to hammer someone like Dylan Hartley for what he's done, alleged to have done. If he abused the ref, he deserves it. He knows that. He absolutely knows that. And nobody would question it, certainly in rugby. But... You know, let's not let that cloud the way what he's achieved as a player and what he'll probably achieve in the future. I mean, he's had an astonishing career. He just plays bang on the edge. Well, so did Brian Moore. But everyone loves Moro, you know. Yeah. So did Graham Dorr. You know, he's a hero here. I mean, you, you're telling me that Dorr never swore at an opponent or stuck an elbow in here or there. I mean, Dorsey was at it more than Dylan Hartley. I can tell you that. So I mean. <laughs> You know, let's just keep it measured. Keep it measured. I think he's got his punishment. And the other at the weekend when the guys, were, the Lions, were meeting up to get on the plane, I actually did sit and think to myself how Dylan Hartley must be feeling. I mean, it, he must have been in hell, and he brought it on himself. I don't argue that, but he must have been in hell, knowing they were at the airport and he was at home. You know, it must have been horrible. Well, looking ahead then to this coming Saturday. Um, it's the first game of the tour. It's in Hong Kong against the Barbarians. Realistically, what are we? What are our expectations, or what are ex- what should our expectations be of the Lions' performance against the Barbarians? If you think about it, they're in a similar boat because they've only just come together themselves. Um, they won't have quite as much uh, champagne in the system as the Barbars, I expect, when they run out. Um, in that they probably won't have been out the night before the game like the Barbars. <laughs> um, I think we we can expect. Potentially a similar scoreline, you know, from the England game. Would England have been a better test? Yeah, probably. But actually, what I think the Lions need to do a weekend for a game like this is win, win relatively comfortably, not concede too many points to prove that, you know, to give everyone confidence that a defensive system is beginning to work because it will be new, for, you know, for mm. all of them. Not leak too many points and just to stay tight and not get injured. I mean, this it's funny, as a former player, I look at this game and it just makes me shiver. I think if I was on the British Lions tour and I twisted my ankle or twisted my knee or cricked my neck playing against the bar bars in Hong Kong in a show-off, you know, a cash cow, I mean, it'd be great to watch, I'll be watching it, but if I twisted my ankle and flew home from there, I would never forgive the people that organised it, you know, I think I just, it just terrifies me, you know, um, of on the players' behalf, I'm sure they're not feeling like that, and I, you know, I hope they're not. But I think we have to see them win relatively comfortably, but don't expect a hammering because this is a new group of players together and playing against some of the best guys in the world in the bar bars. So for you, the tour really starts against Western Force, then. Yeah, for me it does. Yeah, when you really get into those 
midweek games when you're playing against teams who are there'll be a few chips on a few shoulders in that Bar Bars team and that'll be great Paul James will be playing the Bath prop against his mate Adam Jones more than likely and that'd be good that I'll enjoy watching that um, a few points to prove but I think once you get out to Oz and you start the proper dirt track in the proper midweek games playing against teams who are instructed to make life as difficult for you as possible and don't forget if the Western Force beat the Lions, it'll be one of the biggest days in their history. Mm. And that is what they face every Tuesday or Wednesday. Every midweek game is a chance for someone. The biggest day, biggest day of their careers. You know, so they will be tough old games. Well, we'll have a chat about the Western Force game um, when I see you next week. Mm -hmm. um, just one final question um, for now. Um, uh, can, can I push you for a prediction? How do you, how do you see this series going? Um... You can push me, yeah. I think it. The Lions will either win the first two or they'll lose all three. Um, that's what I think. I think they'll either absolutely tear into the Aussies and they won't. The Aussies won't know what's hit them, and they won't be able to live with the Lions' power. Or the Aussies will work. The Aussies will have worked them out before they get there, and it'll be too difficult to claw back after week one. So I think, the, I think the first test, never mind test three, I think test one is absolutely, absolutely vital. And I think if the Lions don't win it, they won't win the series. Now, of course, I did say that was the last question, but um, you, whilst the Lions are undergoing their own examination down in the Southern Hemisphere, you yourself will be um, undertaking mm. quite um, uh, an examination of a different kind. You'll be cycling from John O'Groats to Land's End, I believe. Have I got it the right way round? Yeah, you have, way? sadly. Um, <laughs> I've just been reading up on it, and apparently it's 20% harder because of headwind, which is good news, because uh, I just cut through the wind, being a very svelte figure. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we're doing it for the Bath Rugby Foundation. I'm doing it with Danny Grucock and Lewis Moody and Andy Beatty, who played for Bath for a number of years. And um, we've, done a, we've done as much training as we can. Um, we've all got full-time jobs and we all work, you know, evenings and weekends and all that sort of stuff. And it's been difficult. There's no, that's not an excuse. It's just been difficult to get enough miles in. You know, there's lots of these group emails going around and who fancies a ride at four o'clock on Wednesday? And well, no, I'll be I'll be at the office at four o'clock on Wednesday. Um, but we've trained for it. It's going to be very very difficult. It's 106. 107 mile average a day but there are some very very big 120 mile days in there over the course of the nine days and a lot of climbing so we, obviously you're starting off in northern Scotland there's going to be some climbing Devon, Cornwall it's all it's going to be tough um, very very tough we're sleeping in tents at night and that sort of stuff the charity charity spurs us on um, I think we'll all struggle with it because we're not built to cycle but um as predicted, I'm struggling more than most. I think Danny Brewcock's about the same weight as me, but he's six six and athletic with it. And uh, I've been on lots of long rides with him, and he hasn't seemed to. I haven't seen him tired once yet. We finished 85 miles, and I crawled up the drive, and Danny was bouncing around and you know kicking a football around in the garden with the kids. It made me sick. So I've never seen Lewis Moody tired. So um, I'll see them at the start line every morning. I won't see them again until. Hopefully I make it to the tents at night a couple of hours after them. Um, we'll have a half an hour chat and I'll go back to bed and see them at the start line the next morning and not see them again for a whole day. So we had, we had visions of doing it together. Um, but, um, I, you know, hard as I try, I can't keep up with those guys. So it'll be quite a test. The Foundation does some fantastic work in our area and uh, we've covered it um, on the sports show before Did some uh, with the HITS project. We did yeah. some fantastic work up in Westfield. Um, so for people, obviously you're doing it to raise um, money as well as the profile of the charity. How can people make a donation? We have a Virgin Money uh, donation page. Um, under, under Virgin Money, look for the heavyweights. Um, that's us. There's all sorts of disparaging comments about me and um, a very, very offensive logo which we pulled together, which um, has me, one fat cyclist, hanging back a few yards behind all the athletic ones up the front. Um, unfortunately, it's so accurate, I can't really dispute it. Um, but any donations are welcome. You know, there are, We've had people giving huge amounts of money to us, and we've had people giving a fiver here and a tenner there, and we appreciate all of it. And um, yeah, as a player, as players, myself, Andy, 
Lewis and Danny, we all saw, we all took part in some of the stuff the foundation did, and I see it every day still now, working here at the club. And you know, I've got kids, and there are areas in which they're really confident, there are areas in which they aren't. And to see a kid effectively scared of life is one of the most, it's just um, one of the saddest, most tragic things you can see. So these guys do some amazing stuff, but for me, the stuff that hits home most to me is when they just, they just raised by 1% the self-esteem of a kid from a local area. Just They find a way to do it through sport and it's, it brings tears to your eyes. They're amazing people and they love it. They, they uh, work extremely hard, these guys, and they deserve every penny we raise. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you before, um, before you go. And, uh, we'll, well, I won't look like this when I get back. I'll be super skinny when I get back. You know, I'll be, I won't recognise you. I'll get all the way. I reckon I'll be 18 stone by the time I get back, <laughs> which will <laughs> represent a significant loss. <laughs> David, thank you very much for your Cheers. time. I look forward to seeing, uh, seeing you soon. Cheers.